rejected demon hunter cards what the heck does that mean well blizzard's been showcasing a lot of old card designs for demon hunter like these cards i never know which way to point so basically we're going to be taking a look at some alternate dimension evil doppelganger demon hunter cards that were way more overpowered in some cases than even the demon hunter cards we know today hey buddy watch this for instance, let's kick things off right here with Imprisoned Antian. This is a card that already has a ton of people scared. It deals 10 damage when it awakens from being dormant. It's got 10 attack on the real version, as you'll see up there above me. But I guess somewhere along the line, this was a 10-10 instead of a 10-6, which I, I can't even believe. I already think Imprisoned Antian's really good, really scary, hard to play cards into, very frightening if it goes off on an empty board, which it seems like it can fairly often. And then to make it a 10 health minion too would make it almost impossible to trade into or use any kind of damage to remove around turn five. It would remain equally susceptible to things like Shadow or Death, but uh, you know, rush minions would be so much worse and a lot of decks would be completely stuck on trying to kill this thing as a 10 10. So thank God this came down to 10 6. And I think it could probably even be like an 8 4 to be honest. Uh, to put it in, a, in an okay spot. I'm still worried about it. Of course, time will tell. Now, to be clear, uh, this was like leaked in a video. This wasn't something Blizzard showcased specifically as uh, one of their past designs, but it's clearly a version of the card that was laying around somewhere that made it into a video that probably, you know, got produced before the final revision pass, uh, balance pass on Antion. So I can't say with 100% certainty that this card, you know, was somewhere along the line an idea or a thought of a real card, but it, somebody made this graphic somewhere. So I think that's at least an implication that probably at some point it was indeed a horrifying and frightening 10 10. Thank God Blizzard saw the light on this one, made it nearly a 10 6. So next up here, let's take a look at Priestess of Fury, which started out way different. Uh, it was a five mana 4 6 with Rush and Outcast gain Lifesteal. So I guess a mid-game recovery kind of card, take a trade, get some health back. Uh, that certainly makes sense for Demon Hunter. I don't know how this iterated into the second Priestess of Fury here, you'll see, which was an eight mana, six, six, so very close uh, to the real version with the same effect here, uh, just with a higher cost and a lower stat line. So. For some of you who are worried that Priestess of Fury is going to be really, really powerful, I've got a lot of people saying, like, the best card ever. Um, I do think it's going to be strong. <laughs> I guess at one point it wasn't so strong. It was actually lower stats and higher cost, uh, closer to that perhaps Ragnaros style that a lot of people are comparing it to at 8 mana, but of course it can attack and the damage goes all over the place, so not exactly Ragnaros, I don't think. Probably not as good in some ways. Uh, but then also another balance pass moved it to seven mana and kept it at six six. So I guess um, it got one more bump up in health at some point. So clearly this is one that Blizzard's gone back and forth on quite a few times from a totally different design to something less powerful uh, that finally got buffed quite a bit to where it landed today. So weirdly, that actually gives me a lot of confidence that Blizzard play tested this one and honed in on it really closely and in fact thought it needed a little bump to make sure Demon Hunter was competitive and in a good spot because Demon Hunter needs cards to be good to thrive. It doesn't have a lot of choices. So although I have a lot, a feeling a lot of you will be like, oh my God, why didn't they leave it at 6-6? Six, six? Why didn't they leave it at 8 mana, etc.? cetera? Um, I actually think this is a good sign for the card that it's probably going to feel fair or otherwise they wouldn't have been willing to buff it slightly to get it up to that spot. So interesting look here for sure seeing the progression of this card over time particularly from a pre-release balance standpoint that's really cool so now let's talk about uh, fell summoner we've actually got two past iterations of this card uh it started in a totally different spot as a spell called bind to the cause which was four mana it summoned a demon from your deck and it made that demon dormant for two turns so we see the kind of imprisoned effect in action here uh, but basically, you could play Bind of the Cause, presumably turn four, maybe even turn three with a coin, and you get a really big minion on board, say like turn five, turn six. Now, it often wouldn't have an awaken effect, although it could if you actually hit your imprisoned Antion, it would still awaken. 
but uh, in many cases, it would just be a big stat body, something like a pit commander, for instance. And um, that's pretty scary. Like, that can cheat them out very efficiently from a mana cost standpoint. And I think they can still hit the game early enough to make an impact, especially if they had, like, taunt or some kind of positive effect so that they could use them or force interaction in the board. Something like Rush as well would be a possibility. So that is pretty scary, right? Like, that is a very efficient early play when you kind of have spare mana often in a big control style deck. Anyway... So after Bind of the Cause, whatever reason they changed that when they went to uh, another version of Fell Summoner, also six mana, but that one was a 4-6 Taunt instead of an 8-3 Minion. And this version of Fell Summoner seems really, really strong, again, compared to the final version of Fell Summoner. So I think we saw basically uh, a couple nerf passes here, basically, and clearly some flavor changes as well to get it to a Minion. But a 4-6 Taunt... On turn six, you're not like excited to do that, but it's usually an acceptable sort of play where you're just kind of getting stuff down. And if it summons you a big demon that like also has taunt or some kind of positive effect, of course, then that's even better. Whereas if you play Fell Summoner today, it just like kind of sits there, right? Your opponent's like, oh, I'm not going to kill that for you. So maybe you get an eight attack minion that gets to trade in favorably on a future turn, but the big summon is delayed, right? It doesn't happen immediately. And it leaves it, you know, even more susceptible to all kinds of just cheap removal. So the front half of the body is not worth much. With this other second iteration of Fell Summoner, the body is worth a fair bit. It actually slows down your opponent a lot, denies lethal opportunities potentially. They might have to spend more resources killing it, and then you still get the body. So for me, this one fits that kind of defensively minded game plan much, much better than the current real iteration of Fell Summoner, which I don't think is really going to fit into big Demon Hunter decks. I, possibly it's better than I'm anticipating. But still here, I think some good balance changes. They might have left the card weaker and maybe too weak in some ways, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's okay for cards to have niche spots and not be great, as long as they're not too overpowered. And I think Bind of the Cause could have been in that direction. Like, that seems pretty good to me. So next up here, actually, we have Pit Commander, a card uh, that we put in a big Demon Hunter deck, but uh, it also has a couple past iterations. The first one was a 9-mana 6-8 Demon, that had Taunt and Death Rattle that would summon a demon from your deck, as opposed to an end of turn effect, which the real Pit Commander has. And I do think uh, Death Rattle would probably be better in a lot of cases, although it's not something you can force immediately, as you can with Pit Commander now, where it's, you know, you can guarantee that it happens uh, at the end of your turn, as long as there's one there. Whereas with this Death Rattle, your opponent kind of has to do it for you. I think there are some advantages there, uh, namely that... If you're playing big defensive taunts like a pit commander anyway, um, it doesn't really matter when it gets summoned. It's still going to be able to force that action through it, which is nice. But then I also think it's just really good against like removal. If you think about things like brawls and twisting nethers and such, kind of hides that second body behind the death rattle. So it can be a little bit uh, more awkward for your opponent to deal with. And then, of course, you also have a lot of potential death rattle synergies in Hearthstone where we have few, far fewer end of turn sort of synergies in Hearthstone. And then they changed it to basically the pick mana we know now, but as a 10 mana 9-9 nine nine instead of a 9 mana 7-9. So uh, they gave it a big stat bump, still retained Taunt as it went up a mana cost, moved to end of turn. I'd say that's, you know, a worse card in general than the previous pick commander, and of course worse than our new pick commander. I think the 7-9 body is well worth an additional mana. You'd much rather play these sorts of minions much faster, particularly in combination with something like Raging Fell Screamer. Now you can get Pit Commander down on 7 instead of 8 if it were at 10 mana, and the 2 attack just doesn't matter in a minion like this. That makes almost zero difference as far as I'm concerned. So Pit Commander, I think, got significantly better going from 10 to 9, which could help the uh, viability of this build and archetype a lot. So it's fun to see how, you know, we, we saw this card shift over to the current mold and then still got another balance pass after that. That's kind of a fun path to follow. So now we've got Raging Fell Screamer. Speak of the Fell Screamer. <laughs> it's a 5 mana 6 4 in this past iteration instead of a 4 mana 4 4. And the Battle Cry reads reduce the cost of a demon in your hand by 5, which is pretty insane, right? I already think Raging Fell Screamer is pretty good. Uh, it feels fine to play on Curve. It gets a pretty significant discount so you can cheat something out faster. This one means you're cheating something out really, really fast. Uh, now, it is a little bit different, to be clear. The way the Raging Fell Screamer works is you kind of have a choice 
about what you're going to play to receive the discount. It's the next demon you play. It's not any sort of specific demon. So even if you top decked a demon that wasn't in your hand, you can still play Raging Fell Screamer, bank that value for two or three turns down the line, even if you wanted to, or the tempo kind of. Uh, and with Raging Fell Screamer, that card has to be in hand already. That said, I don't think that's necessarily a challenge by any means. Uh, if you're running a lot of big demons in your deck, you're probably going to have one that's kind of sitting in your hand on turn five anyway. And this is going to really reduce its cost so that you can play it on turn six almost always, and maybe even play it for free in some cases immediately with something like an Imprisoned Antian, or, you know, just play it alongside something else uh, on the following turn for an even bigger swing on that turn six. So even though this is delayed by a mana, I think the discount significance is much higher, and I don't think it's any more problematic to actually get this discount off consistently. So again, I think this is a card that got uh, significantly weaker, which probably a good thing again, because I think Demon Hunter is really, really powerful anyway. Uh, changed the operation a little bit to feel better as well. So I think two great changes here for Raging Fell Screamer. This one feels uh, like a great change. Moving on here to Immolation Aura, it used to be four mana and it would whirlwind three times. Now it's two mana and it whirlwinds twice. But I think this is a really significant buff. I think Immolation Aura actually got better than it used to be. Uh, I think at two mana, it's just far more efficient to slot into a turn, which Demon Hunter cares about. They need to be able to play cards and move their hand around a little bit to slot things into Outcast. So this is sitting in the left-hand side of your hand or maybe the right-hand side. You need to be able to play it and still get off an outcast card and low cost flexibility allows you to do that uh, also i think two damage is often kind of enough for this you might just need to chip through some small boards uh set up some trades with whatever else you have some tokens or your hero power attack and at four mana it's just a bigger commitment and you know although that is kind of a hellfire board clear which has been a sweet spot in many cases i think immolation aura still does enough and does something a little bit different than chaos nova whereas immolation aura here would feel like really close to chaos nova that it's slightly better at dealing with like divine shields and death rattles but i don't know that it'd be distinct enough from a mana cost and efficiency standpoint so immolation aura sort of seems like this whirlwind plus instead of like this chaos nova slash hellfire world which uh, to me feels much much tighter for the class much better fit so i'm really happy to see this change for demon hunter although again Pretty powerful card, so who knows if it's too good. Hey, speaking of Chaos Nova, it's next up. And a pretty simple change here. Chaos Nova went from 6 mana, 5 damage, to 5 mana, 4 damage. And uh, I think that was a significant nerf. I think there are a lot of breakpoints in, in Hearthstone at that 5 health spot. Many things have 5. We've all had those flame strike boards where it's like, oh, God, I don't know how to deal with that 5 health thing. You got a ping, but there's two of them. You're like, oh, no. So I do think a five damage Chaos Nova would be really good. That puts it um, in things like Dragon Fire Potion range for Priest, which was a great card, although it, in fact it's almost identical minus the uh, Dragon specificity there. And uh, although I think Chaos Nova at, at, at five and four is still a pretty good card, I think as you move into the mid game, you're probably spending most or all of your turn on something like this anyway. So it, it does perhaps change Chaos Nova uh, from a like mid to late game answer at six and five into a sort of uh, early game recovery card where you're kind of wiping out your opponent's aggressive start and resetting the game because you might only need four damage to kill kind of their early game minions. But that gives Chaos Nova less utility in the late game, right? You can't maybe use it as successfully later in the game. I think Demon Hunter is going to be so fast and keep up so well anyway that Chaos Nova as it stands as a real card isn't necessarily going to be as valuable as a Chaos Nova at six mana could have been. Again, though, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Demon Hunter is really good. If we're pulling back on the uh, power level of a card for Demon Hunter, that's perhaps a good change, right? And I think this Chaos Nova, the real one, is just a, a hair worse here. Although, I, I recognize that's incredibly debatable. I mean, I think I could really start an argument for either one of these cards being more powerful and convince myself and maybe a few people out there. So for this one, I, I certainly want to hear what you guys think. Which of these cards do you think is better than the other one and which one do you think should be in the game that's kind of healthier for demon hunter both of those are really interesting for me i, I i'd certainly love to hear more arguments and and use cases for each of these because again i think i could be convinced either way all right final card here is furious felfin and this one might be a little bit hard to see clearly a screen grab from some gameplay apparently at one stage it was a 2-3 murloc instead of a 3-2 murloc but otherwise exactly the same and I do think uh, the past version here of Furious Felfin would have been even stronger and much, much better. I think the current real 
F Furious Felfin, it's really hard to say, is a little bit awkward. I, I Four damage is great to trade, but it's often kind of excessive on turn two, and there's not much additional value in the Furious Felfin. I've compared it a lot to like Diving Griffin. Diving Griffin, you don't mind trading in as a 4-1. Wasn't a lot of value in that body, and you're cycling it into a new card. So Furious Felfin, despite being a mana cheaper, trading it in doesn't feel as efficient. But if it was a 3-3, I think it would often trade way better into your opponent's turn one plays, leaving more health on board and still contesting very well. So although they both trade into like one threes, for instance, if you're behind a little bit, your opponent plays a 2-3 stat line, a 2-2. Furious Felfin at 2-3 would trade far, far more favorably. So I like that three attack, three health line, much, much better at kind of stabilizing an early board. Again, it's probably meta dependent. It's deck dependent, context dependent, of course. But I think this was a little bit of a nerf to Furious Felfin in a lot of ways. And uh, that's probably a good thing because I don't think Demon Hunter needs even more great early game utility. But this is another one I think very debatable. I'm curious if you guys feel the same way I do or do you think the 3-2 Felfin is better than the 2-3 Felfin, or do you agree with me, vice versa? I just realized how difficult it is to understand what the heck I'm talking about half the time because we got so many of the same cards here to discuss. But uh, certainly share your thoughts on this one. And that wraps it up, folks. Those are the alternate designs for these uh, Demon Hunter cards. Pretty cool to take a look and see what Blizzard was thinking and see some of the changes they made. Overall, I certainly have to say uh, some, some cool design insights here and seeing how they changed cards. And I think mostly in a far more healthy direction, a, a much um, better direction for the game as far as balance is concerned. So adding a little bit of trust there, you know, still some cards that are concerning at the end of the day. So we'll have to see how they, how they do in live Hearthstone. Maybe they didn't go far enough in some cases, but uh uh, time will tell on that one. So verdict is still out, but it's still really cool that Blizzard's willing to share some of these behind the scenes looks at these cards and uh, give us some, some insights into those design processes. So, uh, share your thoughts on all these below. Of course, how would you change these even further? Or what would you have used an old version? For instance, always curious to hear that, but until then, uh, thanks much for watching and until next time game on.